What's this mark of the beast? What's this mark of the beast? Three and a half years of tribulation on the earth. How does it fit in into the narrative? Well, the Bible tells us in, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18 about this mark of the beast. What's this mark of the beast? It's the only time that the Bible really refers to it. And the word mark there in, in, the, in the Greek language means it like a tattoo, really, or an, or an etching or something that's scratched into something. So what's this mark of the beast? It says it's going to be upon the right hand or the forehead. And it says you can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. Now, people wonder all about this as some kind of chip that's under the computer skin chip. or computer chip or barcode. There's been all, all kinds of speculation. The mark of the beast is 666 there in, in the book of Revelation. And what's this mark of the beast? What I think this is, is it, it says there that it's the number of a man's name. Now, some have taken 666 to be one short of 777. In other words, God is perfection with seven, and this shows that this Antichrist who says he's God is actually 666. But I think it's actually going to be the numerical value of his name. In other words, you can, like in the, the Greek and Hebrew language, you can take the letters of the alphabet, they have numerical value. And so you can take a person's name and actually add that up and you come up with a number. So I think his number will, his name will actually equal 666. That's how he'll be identified. So when people take that mark on their right hand or forehead, they'll actually be taking his name upon them, which pictures the idea of ownership. Is this during the time of Antichrist, when the Antichrist is yes. at, its, at his prominent place uh, in the world of leadership and, and basically the execution of how economy is done will be through this mark? That's right. It's going to be three and a half years, I take it, of this coming time of tribulation on the earth when he's going to rule the world. That's right. It's going to be three and a half years. Not only will there be a one world government, but there will be a one world economy. And we can see how that can happen today very, very easily. Uh, the tribulation period. That's right, it's going to be three and a half years. The tribulation period. That's right, it's going to be three and a half years. At some point in time, this Antichrist figure is going to come on the scene and make a treaty, the Bible says, with Israel. And that's going to trigger this three and a half years of tribulation on the earth. Three and a half years of tribulation on the earth. The tribulation period. The tribulation period. There's going to be some events that happen that trigger the Antichrist then is going to take the world over. He's going to dominate the world and rule the world, and it's going to be a reign of terror that's going to come really when he's on the earth. The tribulation period, the Antichrist forming the coalition, uh, or made the coalition with other nations around the world, and a peace treaty is signed. So there's peace, and we've got the global currency going on with the mark of the beast, and so there's prosperity. The tribulation period, and now then what he's going to do, and he's going to begin to persecute the Jewish people because the tribulation period, that's right, it's going to be three and a half years, three and a half years of tribulation on the earth. Obviously, God has made promises to them. Right. Satan wants to get rid of them right. and wipe them out. But he's going to dominate the world at that point in time. So this world is going to end with this great apostasy, the Bible calls it, a great falling away when this one man is going to be worshipped as God. We've been talking about the end of the tribulation period. I guess the end really comes there. Three and a half years of tribulation on the earth. That Armageddon. It does. You know, the Bible uh, tells us that really the, the culmination of history uh, of this age is the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And really they happen kind of in conjunction with one another. The Battle of Armageddon is interrupted by the second coming of Jesus. Now, Armageddon, that, that word's only used one time in the Bible. It's in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, yet it's probably the one word that people know about the end times more than yeah. any other. Armageddon. But it's actually a literal place. In, in Hebrew, the word har means a hill or a mountain. And so it's, it's really Mount Megiddo. And uh, Mount, if, if anyone's ever been to Israel, they know that little that site there of Megiddo that exactly. overlooks the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Megiddo, yeah, yeah. 20 miles long, 14 miles wide. Napoleon called it uh, the world's most perfect battlefield. Interesting. And so the Bible tells us in the end times, right before the second coming of Christ, all the armies of the earth are going to be gathered there to the land of Israel. Now it's interesting, it never tells us why. And they'd be gathered there because things haven't been going that well. They're going to come to try to destroy the Antichrist. Uh, some believe it's there to try to once and for all wipe out the Jewish people. But what we do know is when the armies are gathered there to fight, that the Lord Jesus is going to return from heaven. He's going to interrupt uh, this battle of Armageddon. It's been called, you know, the mother of all wars. Yeah. But that's where world history is going to end. One of the things I think is fascinating is I studied world history as a, as a younger person. You end up, all you study is wars. When you study world history. We're defined by wars, aren't we? We are. We're defined by wars. Every, every nation kind of is. And Boundaries. really, uh -huh. history is going to ultimately culminate at this mother of all wars, this campaign of Armageddon. Mark, as we continue, um, 
The birth of Israel does seem to be, in 1948, that does seem to be the, the moment in time in history when, when the church could look and say, okay, the, the, the prophecies for the most part have been completed. And then we move into the era since the end of World War II, the birth of Israel, and you see uh, transportation acceleration, you see uh, international communication, things that probably even prior to World War II seemed bizarre or strange to read, but today we've seen what's happened in the last 60 years. And it is phenomenal when you see how quick communication, banking, globalization, as you mentioned, it all just seems to fall in line. Plus, all of the geographical activity that's happening with nations surrounding Israel, it just seems again to be taking us down a prophetic highway. Well, it does, because you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's a passage, it's right after Ezekiel 37, it predicts the regathering of Israel in the end times. Ezekiel 38 and 39 mentions a coalition of nations that are going to invade Israel in the end times. One of them is Rosh, which I believe is, is the nation of, of Russia. Is that the army to the north that yes. you, that you see right. over the Bible? Yeah, and also Persia is mentioned in that passage, which Persia was changed to Iran in 1935. Right. It became the Islamic Republic of Iran in the late 1970s. So. Here you have these nations mentioned and others as well there. Well, it's not very hard to envision those nations coming against Israel, what we see happening over there now. So a lot of the coalitions the Bible speaks of in the end times are coming together, just as the scriptures predict. So th there really are a lot of signs out there for us today that lead us to believe that, that the coming of Christ could be very soon. Practical application as a pastor, you're a theologian, uh, you're a scholar, you're, you spend a lot of time looking at the Bible through a prophetic lens. How can we as Christ followers uh, best prepare? Is there a occupy until I come? Is there an aggressiveness or do we just, are we passive and just wait? What do we do? You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some has been encouraged one another. And then it says, and do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, that must mean we can see the day drawing near, or that, or that really wouldn't make any sense. And so I think that what that's telling us is as we see the day drawing near, we ought to ratchet up our own spiritual lives, the intensity of it, the urgency. Well, every place that the, that the coming of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament that I can think of, there's always practical application. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 4, some believers have died, and he tells them about the rapture, and he says, comfort one another with these words. In 1 uh, first, first, uh, Corinthians 15, he talks all about the rapture, and then he says, Therefore be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain. John 14, you know, Jesus said, Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So it's a comforting word. And then the, the last one I love is in 1 John chapter 3, where John says there in the passage, everyone who fixes his hope on him purifies himself as he himself is pure. So the, the coming of the Lord is a purifying hope. So it's a purifying hope, it's a motivating hope, it's a comforting hope, it's a calming hope. There, every place it's mentioned in the New Testament, there's always that application with it. And I can't think of anything more comforting in these days in which we live than to know that Jesus is coming back someday Amen. and that He's going to uh, deliver us from